Welcome to Low Carb 101. In this presentation, I'm going to be introducing you to the foundations of low carb. For those of you who are yet to start a low carb lifestyle, I'll give you some tips about how to get off to a good start. And for those who are doing low carb or have done it before and felt it didn't work, especially in terms of weight loss, I'll be giving you some tips in terms of getting past those stalls and plateaus. The most important thing for me is that wherever you're starting your journey from, that you can find this information accessible. I know that sometimes it can be a bit confronting when we get onto the internet or social media and we see all these rippling six packs and people telling us that we just absolutely have to take a cold shower every morning. But the reality is that, you know, certainly with me, you know, I've got the, the remainder of a mummy tummy and there's plenty of people out there with mummy tummies or dad bods and we're just wanting to get ourselves into better shape and to manage our health conditions a little bit better. So let's set the scene. The question really is what is a species appropriate diet for human beings? We look at nature and even when we were in our natural habitat eating natural food uh, we certainly didn't struggle with obesity and chronic health conditions like we do today. So really the conclusion uh, that we can come to is that the food that we are surrounded by is no longer actually a species appropriate diet for people. In the wild, animals don't count calories. They don't think about whether they're a carnivore, omnivore or herbivore. They just eat what's naturally available to them. But the problem for us is that the, the food that's available to us isn't actually very close to what nature provided us. So if we look back to a pre-agricultural time, uh, our brains were larger, our dentition, that's our teeth, were better. And even as far back as Egyptian times, we're seeing evidence in Egyptian mummies that of the appearance of uh, cardiovascular disease. So what we have ended up with is an obesogenic food environment. We have modified the animals and plants that we eat. And this is even before the advent of genetic engineering, we were selectively breeding plants and certainly something which uh, is significant in regard to this for me is that our fruit nowadays is anywhere up to 100 times bigger, sweeter and juicier and delivering a lot more sugar. And it doesn't really matter that it's natural sugar, sugar is sugar. The other thing that has changed is we're no longer following seasonal availability. I certainly remember there was a time when when it was winter you just couldn't get your hands on strawberries. If you wanted that as a garnish for a dinner party, good luck, you had to choose something else. But nowadays we have all the different seasonal foods available to us all year round, whether it's locally grown in hothouses or whether it's uh, transported to us from overseas. The other thing that has changed is that we're actually eating for a greater portion of our day. Uh, certainly when we had to hunt our food, we got to eat if we caught it or if we dug it up or if we found a plant. Um, and the other thing that has changed is that we're absolutely bombarded with information and food marketing. So there's companies who sell food to us. They, they're the ones who put food in the shopping. Uh, stores and the supermarkets and they're the ones also bombarding us with messages that we eat need to eat more of their food. Now part of what I want you to get out of this presentation is to be a critical consumer of health information and food information and realise when you're being marketed to. So that packet of lollies that's promoted to us as being healthier because it's 99% fat free, we really have to question whether that's the case anymore. So let's look at what a definition of low carb is. Very simply put, it's an intake of under 150 grams of carbohydrates each day. Now, in a way, this could be the sole slide and we could just say, yep, ticked it off, there we go. 
but I am going to work through some of the more uh, detailed information. You also notice on this page here that there's a little hand that's just to wave at you and say this is important information. Uh, this is stuff that anyone who's taking part in a low carb lifestyle just needs to get your head around. Now I know that some of the people who are on keto will be getting twitchy about the idea of under 150 gram. Most people who are doing keto are aiming for under 20, perhaps 50. People who are doing therapeutic keto are often aiming for under 10 grams per day. So just a little quick glossary here. We uh, There's a few sets of information. So the important thing, and you'll hear people talk about this a lot, which is the macronutrients. The interesting thing about macronutrients is our body can break down any of these for energy. Any of these can supply energy. I've started off with protein because it's so important. Indeed, the derivation of the word protein uh, means basically of primary importance. Uh, protein is broken down to amino acids and these are the building blocks for every cell in our body. They're there for building cells, repairing cells and for the function of cells, including really important things like neurotransmitters. So we certainly don't want to become protein deficient. Uh, you'll notice that there's that E. Now these amino acids, or there's a whole host of them, are essential. That means that our body can't cobble together molecules that it's gotten from other things and make these amino acids. We have to take them in through our diet. Now we move on to fat. You'll notice that fat has also got an E, which means there are some essential fatty acids too. These are omega-3 and omega-6. Now the interesting thing is omega-6 is really, really abundant in the modern diet. And even though it's essential to our body, we're probably taking in way too much of it through these delicate polyunsaturated oils that have been promoted to us. Interestingly, uh, a zero fat diet would eventually kill us. Fat is essential for our bodies. Indeed, uh, we don't recognize that the cell membrane of every cell in our body has got a phospholipid coating. This lipid coating is in every cell of our body. So fat is absolutely essential. Now we move on to carbohydrate. You notice there is no E next to carbohydrate. Carbohydrate isn't actually essential. And our clever livers are actually capable of producing glucose themselves through a process called gluconeogenesis. So there's this idea out there that there's a certain minimum amount of carbohydrate that the body must have and the brain must have to function in particular. Now, I, I'd like to replace the word must to prefer. The body has got a preferential way of burning energy. The body is actually really efficient and it will usually take the easy way. If it is presented with glucose, it will burn glucose. If we present it with glucose and fat, it will burn the easy energy, which is glucose, which we get from carbohydrates, and it will save the fat for later, which means it will probably get stored. We'll talk more about that later. Let's move on to micronutrients. These are typical, typically measured in very, very small quantities, uh, uh, milligrams or micrograms. So we've got the vitamins and minerals and a whole host of other micronutrients. I'll give you an example of a couple. One would be choline. It's very similar to the B vitamins and often gets lumped in with that. Another one, for instance, is bioflavonoids. We find these in the brightly colored fruit and vegetables and their action is is to actually extend the effect of vitamin C, which in itself has got an antioxidant effect. So these uh, other micronutrients can help the function of the vitamins and minerals that our body uses. The other third thing we need to get our heads around is quantities. When we're talking about uh, low carb, often we'll be talking about things like uh, measurements. So when we talk about consuming 30 grams of protein, we actually need to differentiate that it's not 30 grams of meat or yogurt or whatever protein rich food that we're eating. So 
roughly uh, most meat has got about is about 30 to 35 percent protein when we eat dried meats we've removed the moisture and so therefore the percentage of protein can be much higher so if my daily uh, RDI and RDI stands for recommended daily intake so if my RDI is somewhere between 50 and 60 grams of protein and by the way this is government recommendations which I consider to be minimum for good health uh, so if I'm trying to get 50 let's say rounded up to 60 and I'm getting that from a steak 200 grams of steak will provide me with 60 grams of protein in amongst that there will also be some fat and the fat will be broken down into saturated fat monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat and there'll also be a whole host of micronutrients so the other way uh, when people talk about macros they can either talk about them in terms of weight we're trying to keep our uh, carbohydrate in under a certain number of grams or we can be talking about what our ratio is uh, so an, a very average for, and this is for again the dietary guidelines an average uh, Western diet will be a minimum of 15% of protein 20 to 35% fat and 40 to 65 percent carbohydrates so you'll see in the what some of us call the SAD the standard Australian slash American diet and it is a bit sad sometimes in the sad diet um, you'll see that the absolute bulk of nutrients and energy are coming from carbohydrate rich foods now why do we need nutrients let's just look so uh, probably the most uh, popular theory of obesity is what we call energy balance which otherwise and you'll hear me call it kiko which is calories in and calories out so the interesting thing about kiko is that i think we've come to a point where we've shown it doesn't really work there's only fundamentally two reasons why it would fail either you're taking in too much energy or you're not burning enough off and, and that's really disheartening for so many of us where we're trying to smash ourselves at the gym, eat a low calorie, low fat diet, and it just doesn't work for it. And that's because Kiko doesn't take into account this intricate and complex hormonal system that actually uh, regulates how we use energy. So here we go, we've got a very simple formula of basically um, how we get energy from wood and interestingly you'll notice there there's a C for carbon and an H for hydrogen and an O for oxygen we will meet these molecules later on when we talk about what a carbohydrate actually is so the the wood goes into Thomas the tank engine it gets burnt it creates heat it creates steam and the engine goes on but the reality is we are different to Thomas um, the macro and micronutrients that we take in are actually incorporated into our cells it's there to build cells to repair cells and to make sure that our cells function every day our, so this diagram here which you can see is absolutely intricate and the writing is so tiny is just one single a representation of one cell in our body now those are all the complex chemical uh, reactions that are happening in that cell indeed each second we have 30 billion chemical reactions happening in our body which is pretty amazing and almost uh, beyond comprehension so we eat and the food that we take in is not just for energy it provides resources for ourselves and it's also regulated by our hormones so here we go what is a carbohydrate you see there there's a single molecule and it's got uh, six carbon 12 hydrogen six oxygen and generally we represent it as a hexagon so um, there are three uh, monosaccharides that we know of which are glucose fructose or fructose depending on where in the world you're from and also galactose now the interesting thing that a lot of people forget about and i do see a lot of uh, 
sugar campaigners or anti-sugar campaigners, they'll speak out very strongly that we need to reduce the amount of sugar in our life. And then they'll be posting about their yummy pasta dinner. Now, what they've happened to forgotten is that pasta is made up from grains and all these starchy plant foods, uh, what a starch is, is a polysaccharide. It is a chain of glucose molecules that are joined together. Now, they're even broken down mechanically or physically by chewing mashing so that mashed potato that you might love is like just think about it as pre-digested potato that might put you off a little bit but anyway uh, so and also they can be broken down by enzymes in our bodies so the thing that we need to rem remember about glucose is it doesn't matter if it comes from an apple or some cornflakes or a chocolate bar. Glucose is glucose, fructose is fructose. Because they come from an apple, that's not what makes them healthier. The molecules are just the same. What makes fruit healthier is the fact that it's got fiber with it, which is interestingly another form of carbohydrate, but it's not available for us to break down and convert into energy. The fiber moderates the influence of uh, a sugar spike um, of glucose coming into our bloodstream. The other thing about fruit is that it is full of micronutrients, but probably too sweet. So let's have a look at this. This is our, um, this is the Australian Dietary Guidelines and the servings from the five food groups. And I'm just going to work through these and uh, we'll, we'll have a look at where we're going to be finding carbohydrates. The first one is vegetables and legumes. And certainly you will find carbohydrates. You'll find them both in the form of glucose, which is accessible for energy or sugars and fiber, which is not accessible. Um, Legumes do are a source of protein, but you'll find that for the protein they contain, they will offer up far more starch. Fruit, definitely a source of sugars and some fiber. Grains, absolutely a source of carbohydrate. Lean meat is actually zero carb. So that's why you'll find when we come to our next chart that meat is uni universally accepted in any of the family members of the low carbohydrate traditions. So milk, yogurt, cheese, generally dairy products, uh, they bring some protein and some fat depending on which ones they are specifically. Our dietary guidelines recommend that we uh, use low fat dairy, but I think the evidence for that is certainly under question these days. Now dairy does have its own form of carbohydrate and that is lactose. As we get older, our production of lactase, which is the enzyme our body uses to break down lactose, uh, can uh, wind down. And you might find as we get older that we struggle to digest dairy as easily as we have in the past. Now the interesting column here is active people extra servings. So if you're an active male, you can have three extra servings from any of these food groups, and that's per day, or from discretionary food groups. Now that's quite a concern because these discretionary food groups basically include what we would known as junk food and what is specified in the guidelines as junk food that is high sugar, high fat, processed food, that type of thing. So, you know, um, I don't really like the idea that um, there's potentially three serves a day of discretionary foods. I think most of us would find that if weight loss is a goal for us, that would certainly take us off track pretty fast. So let's have a look at the low carb family. Now, this is where, as you can see, there's so many names for it and there is quite a lot of confusion out there. We've got our LCHF and the H in itself typically stands for high, low carb, high fat. Now the high fat part of it is just when we reduce carbohydrates, if we keep the pro, the protein portion of our diet, it means this percentage of macros is going to change and it means that relatively we're taking in higher fat. Some people prefer to swap out the word healthy and that it is low carb healthy fats. Um, now keto, you'll notice that I've put some initials there. Now where does the word keto come from? It's ketogenic diet and what it's referring to then is that we're trying to put our body into 
nutritional ketosis. Now, nutritional ketosis is that we reduce carbohydrates to a point where we force our bodies to become fat burners, ideally for all of the time. So in many keto diets, people are aiming for under 20 grams of carbs per day. Um, and there you'll see these initials I put there that there's, even within keto, there's quite a bit of variety. There's dirty keto, which so long as your macros are right, it doesn't really matter the source. So with dirty keto, if you're eating fathead pizza and keto donuts and probably not eating a lot of fruit and vegetables, it may not matter. This works for some people and for a lot of us, it doesn't. Uh, clean keto, that's gonna be where you're going to be a bit more careful and you'll see people that are really passionate about things like uh, pasture fed meat and animal products. Now the difference with pasture fed fun fundamentally means that the fatty acid ratio is different and there's more omega-3 which is better for us. Now the tea I've put there, there are forms of therapeutic keto, for instance for treating epilepsy uh, and other neurological disorders like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's and some people are using it now for depression and anxiety. So for therapeutic keto, some people are trying to keep their uh, number of carbs under 10 grams per day. Banting uh, is most commonly found in South Africa and uh, one of its greatest proponents is the wonderful Professor Tim Noakes and the New Nutrition Network who I just want to give a big shout out to. They're the organisation that I did my low carb accreditation through and they've provide fantastic information. It's readily accessible on social media or the internet. Now we've got our friends the paleo. Now it's really important that you recognise that some paleo is indeed not low carb. If you eat a whole stack of dates and maple syrup and honey, it's not gonna be low carb anymore. But generally, that most of us who do paleo, and certainly that's where I started out, um, we're trying to keep the carbs lower. Uh, paleo is really trying to mimic uh, that really old ancestral way of eating, which is why we'll find some other names for paleo like ancestral, primal, stone age, um, that type of thing. So the interesting, the major difference with paleo is that they don't eat legumes and they don't eat dairy. And most versions of paleo are trying to keep alcohol intake pretty low carb. Now the last member of the low carb family is zero carb. The, the reality is that most vegetables, uh, even ones that grow uh, above ground and are not starchy, will carry some carbs with them. They're quite low carb, um, but if you're trying to be zero carb, the easiest way to do that is just to be carnivore and eat animal products which have zero carbs in them. You'll notice there's a whole bunch of other names. Some of them are trademarked. Uh, one I'll just pick out as an example is the WALS protocol, which is based loosely on the paleo diet and is designed specifically by Dr. Terry Walls to help people who are trying to manage their MS. Now here we've got a little bit of a matrix of our different uh, types of low carb diets and the things that are red list, green list, orange list. So universally you'll see that animal products, meat and egg are accepted. We would differentiate that dairy, dairy is off the list for paleo. Uh, Non-starchy veggies, that's veggies that grow above the ground are generally okay for all the members of the family except when you get to zero carb. Um, you'll notice that I've put a grey list in against dairy for zero carb. A lot of people who are zero carb do still eat cheese and some dairy products such as cream, um, but there are others who choose not to. Um, then we've got a whole variety of things. Uh, I'll be putting this in a resource for you to download. So why would we do low carb? So what I'm starting to see of the research is coming out. So definitely low carb is showing us that it has the mo it is the most effective uh, treatment for weight loss in terms of losing weight and sustaining that weight loss. The other thing that's really significant and has uh, definitely had very strong uh, grassroots growths and is now coming into the mainstream is using low carb to manage type one diabetes. Now I say manage because there is no cure for type one. And uh, low carb can also be used to 
uh, manage and reverse type 2 diabetes. And the same thing, I don't use the word cure for type 2 because those of us who are insulin resistant, and I certainly put myself in this group, um, we will be insulin resistant for life and we need to have our diet to manage this for life. What we want to do is develop insulin sensitivity. So there's a whole host of conditions and I'm sure that there's going to be speakers who are going to cover these off in far greater conditions. Um, one thing I will just point out in terms of reducing blood pressure, uh, it's not talked about very much out there in the public sphere, but part of why low carb is so effective for reducing uh, blood pressure is that we forget that insulin doesn't just have a mechanism in the body to, re to push glucose out of our blood into our cells. Um, so insulin also acts and has an effect on our kidneys where they retain more sodium. Now, if we think about our bodies as a big bag of salty water, there's a general rule of thumb we, uh, that we say, where salt is, water will follow. So when we increase the amount of sodium in our body, we'll also increase the amount of water in our body. When we increase our plasma volume, just like when we turn the hose on, uh, higher and faster, the pressure inside that tube, which is our blood vessels, will increase as well. So uh, low carb is very effective for reducing uh, blood pressure. Now, what I want to do is just very briefly talk about a few mechanisms where low carb is helpful in supporting a whole range of health conditions. The first one is that low carb is probably one of the best anti-inflammatory diets there is out there. Um, certainly when we are rich in these uh, natural oils such as olive oil, avocado oil, and certainly saturated fats are very, very stable in our bodies. So when we have unstable fats in our bodies, they oxidize and part of the body's reaction to that is inflammation. The other thing uh, that is a benefit of low carb is what we call mitochondrial function. You're seeing the diagram there, that's a diagram of a cell. The mitochondria are the little power conversion units in our cells. And they're the ones that are actually capable of breaking down protein, fat or carbohydrates. Now they do it very efficiently and can produce about 15 times more energy from a single glucose molecule than uh, glycolysis. Uh, can produce. So the interesting thing is when our mitochondria are working well, our cells have abundant energy and they themselves work very well. We see mitochondrial dysfunction is part of the picture of things like pain syndromes and fatigue syndromes like chronic fatigue. Also, the other thing is that mito mitochondrial dysfunction is part of this general picture of aging. If we look at our two very energy hungry types of cells being nerve cells and and muscle cells, we look at all our, uh, how our senses dwindle as we age, and we take that just as a normal part of aging. But my belief is that it doesn't have to be normal aging. The other thing is we look at um, uh, nerve plus muscle cells together. They're commonly found together in cardiac cells, and we definitely wanna keep our cardiac cells in the best health possible. The third part or the third aspect where low carb is so effective for managing health conditions is in terms of controlling blood glucose. Uh, we'll have much better, much fewer uh, spikes, and I call this the blood glucose roller coaster. If you eat cereal for breakfast, you'll be getting on that roller coaster at breakfast and it will be taking you for a ride all day long. And it's indeed these ups and downs, and it's when we reach high. Uh, high amount of glucose in our body that it's actually very da uh, damaging to the insides of our um, blood vessels. So we definitely don't want our uh, blood glucose levels to be shooting up and down all over the place. So I'm just doing this slide for people and I know that 
you know, the statistic for Australia is that roughly two thirds of adults are overweight or obese. And so weight loss will be a goal for many, many of us. The interesting thing, so I'm just gonna take you through, uh, and, and this is an important slide if you're interested in weight loss, because this is basically the key to everything. So if we wanna lose weight, what are we really trying to lose? We're actually trying to lose fat. We certainly don't wanna, uh, be losing lean muscle mass, that's bones, organs, and most importantly, muscle. So we want to be burning fat. We want to be sparing our lean mass, and yet we want to somehow access and burn our own fat stores. And there's two basic ways we can do about that is uh, either what we call caloric restriction, which is we restrict our calories, so that even if we do eat uh, food, which is a rich source of glucose, um, we will burn through it, that we offer ourselves such a small amount of it that we burn through it quite quickly and go into fat burning. Now, the problem with caloric restriction when you're not in fat burning mode generally is that it's actually quite miserable. You will feel hungry and it is quite, well, either somewhere between annoying and painful, but the word I'd use is miserable. So for me, the really effective way is by carbohydrate restriction. So we can still eat other foods that are not offering a whole lot of glucose to our body. So we're sustaining our body with energy. We're just removing glucose as an option, which forces our body to um, burn fat. Now, the important thing is that we don't eat excessive amount of fat because if we take in excessive dietary fat, that our body has no reason to burn its own stores. So eventually we come to a point where, you know, our portion control and our serving sizes out total energy intake does count. Um, so if we move on to our next things, uh, our orange row is what we need to avoid. So this is a mechanism that we're trying to avoid. When we eat carbs, um, it's broken down to glucose and the glucose enters our blood and elevates our blood glucose. Now our body's trying to regulate that with hormones and that hormone is insulin. So insulin will push glucose out of the bloodstream and into the cells where it can actually be used because it's not doing a lot of good in the bloodstream. It's actually quite damaging. So the thing we forget about an insulin response is that it actually toggles us over into fat storing mode as well. So we actually lock away our own fat stores and we're not able to burn them anymore. So it's really important that that's another good reason to reduce the amount or restrict carbohydrates is to reduce the insulin response and unlock our fat stores so that we can actually burn them. The other really great benefit about low carb is that it helps moderate our uh, hunger hormones. And these are the hormones that are gonna control our appetite. When we eat more fat, the interesting thing is that these hunger hormones aren't triggered by carbohydrates at all. They are triggered primarily by fat and by protein. So they help with satiation, which is feeling full. They help with satiety, which is feeling full for longer so that we can stretch ourselves further between meals and space our meals further apart. So we will be eating potentially, uh, certainly before I did low carb, I had no off switch and now I have a very strong off switch. I might still have food on my plate and my body says, no, dinner's over and that's the end of it. So we might eat less from our plate and we'll eat less often. Sometimes it can take a while for this uh, mechanism to correct itself. So uh, don't expect it to come online instantly. So let's, how do we get off to a good start? The very first thing I'd like you to think about is what is your why? For a lot of us, um, especially for any of us, uh, I've, I've got a 10 year old daughter and she weighs 30 odd kilos. She's really heavy to lift. And it's quite stunning for me to think that I used to weigh, I was at least 30 to 35 kilos overweight. I was carrying around in terms of my own body mass, the equivalent of a 10 year old child strapped onto my body every day. Being overweight is actually just exhausting. I also got to the stage where I had a number of health conditions going on and I didn't feel very good inside my own skin just in terms of day-to-day -day living and energy. So think about if you can remember that why, hopefully that will motivate you through the times when you get a bit stuck or things feel a little bit hard. 
The other thing I want you to consider is your personal context. If you do have type 2 diabetes in particular, or have a hypertension, which is high blood pressure, and are on medication for these conditions, when you start low carb, your blood glucose levels are going to be a lot lower and your blood pressure might drop quite fast. And you certainly will need to stay in touch with your uh, primary care physician or your GP and make sure that your medication is adjusted um, so that your blood glucose is not getting too low or your blood pressure is not getting too low. You know, if that happens with blood pressure, you may start feeling dizzy. The third thing, I will talk about this in the next slide, is measuring up. Uh, for me, data is king, and I think it's really good to always have that uh, beginning picture of where you started off. And certainly if uh, I ever feel, you know, if I have a, a bad day or if I go off track or anything like that, I can look back to where I was five or nearly ten years ago and think, wow, my body and my life are very different. So... When you're ready to go, grab a green list and you can search the internet for this. There's one, there would be paleo green lists. Uh, one of the ones pictured here is the Banting green list. Also, I've got uh, the lovely fridge magnet from A Fat Lot of Good, which is an Australian book written by Dr. Peter Bruckner. Uh, so grab your green list and really what we want to be doing is mainly eating off the green list with minimising things off the orange and avoiding things, foods out of the red list. Now, the thing is, the more orange list items, the more servings of them you have every day, the slower your progress will be. So the more tightly you can stick to the green list, the better it will be. Next thing is get ready. Uh, in terms of shelves, I know that so many of us, when we start low carb, we're actually the only person in our household. So cleaning out the whole kitchen, as much as we would love to do it, is not always possible. Um, still in my household, there are people who eat pasta and rice and potatoes, although I choose not to. But I definitely have my low carb shelf and that's where all my low carb stuff is and they have their carby shelf and somehow I've actually went managed to successfully put it into its own little mental zone and I don't eat from that carby shelf. The other thing also is that there's going to be lots of us who have trigger foods and it might be ice cream or chips or lollies or chocolate or biscuits. If you can't help yourself, try not to bring them in the house. So this is where the foods that go into your shopping carts, that's where you're actually making that decision. Rather than agonising over it and being tortured by that thing sitting there in your shelf, um, it's for some of us, it's better that it doesn't even reach the house. Now, last thing is, I said cook and enjoy. Uh, certainly with low carb, I encourage people to prepare most of their own meals wherever possible. Uh, that is because when you prepare your own food from fresh ingredients that are close to their natural form and relatively unprocessed, we've just got greater control over what our food is in the end. And the last thing is enjoy. What you're going to find is that when when there's more fat in your food that the food is actually so much more palatable and satisfying and it's very enjoyable even though what we're doing at the same time is reducing the amount of sweet stuff that we have. In terms of measuring up, you can do all these basics ones. Again, I'll put this in a resource for you, so we're not going to talk through all of it. Um, apart from uh, your height versus waist ratio, this is actually considered nowadays to be more significant, significant than body mass index, which is BMI. So BMI is just a function of height versus weight, but we know that people who are very muscly often come up having a high BMI. Um, so the height to waist ratio, why that is significant is because this central adiposity, otherwise known as belly fat, and that's the fat that's lying next to all our essential organs is, and is posing the greatest danger and is associated with the greatest risk of uh, promoting lifestyle diseases. Please do take some before photos. I didn't, but it's really worth doing. And I do want you to have faith that your before photos are worth taking and you can make these wonderful positive changes to your body. The other thing you might notice, do take a photo of your face as well. And you might notice changes in your skin and things like the grey circles under the eyes once you have uh, 
better energy levels. There are a whole range of blood tests which can be helpful. And sometimes when we come to weight loss stalls or we feel like things aren't changing fast enough, certainly there are uh, indicators such as liver function for those who've got fatty liver. Uh, these indicators can change as quickly as two or three weeks. So if we get these blood tests done, even if the outside of our body doesn't look like it's changing very much, the inside of our body still is. Now, one note I've put on here, the very important one is with your lipid panel, have this done, have this blood test done before you start low carb. When you become a fat burner, you're going to be freeing up fat stores and transporting them around your body to burn. This might create some irregular results in a lipid panel in your blood test. So, and it might worry your doctor and they might think that low carb is a disaster and tell you to stop low carb. But really what's happening is just your body's getting used to being a fat burner. So have it before you start. And then once you're a few months into, down the track and your body's settled into being a regular fat burner. So again, five, five pretty basic rules with low carb is wherever possible, stick to jerf, just eat real food. Uh, unprocessed foods are certainly the best and we're seeing uh, a growing body of energy that highly processed foods are just doing us uh, no good at all and are uh, associated more and more strongly with bad health outcomes. The interesting thing about processed foods, and I'll put this specifically the ones that we would consider junk food, the formula for junk food is it is high carb, it is high fat, high energy and low in micronutrients. Those essential vitamins and minerals. So the interesting thing is that we don't find this combination in nature. It's very, very rare, but it's very common in our uh, manufactured processed foods. So steer clear of them whenever you can. As a rule of thumb, when you're looking at uh, nutrition information on packages, uh, look for how many grams of carbohydrates total. This is not just sugar, it's total carbohydrates. For instance, if we look at something like a, a pre-processed uh, pizza base, it doesn't have a huge amount of sugar in it, but it can be something like 80% carbs. That means, and that's only per 100 grams, so if you're eating a 400 gram pizza base, um, then that's a lot of carbs that you're eating. So as a rule of thumb, under 5% or 5 grams per 100 grams of food, 5 grams of carbs per 100 grams of food is a good rule of thumb. 5 and 10 is okay, but once we get over 10, we really need to look at our serving size. I know lots of people who are low carb do love their 80, 90% chocolate, and um, some of them are over 20 percent carbohydrate but the reality is you're having a teeny tiny serving the other thing to think about these treat foods is whether they're really going to tr trigger you back into uh, wanting to eat more sugary things as a rule of thumb uh, I really encourage people to eat three square meals and avoid the snacking. If you feel the need to snack, it means that you didn't eat enough at your meal. So do eat until you feel good and full and chances are you'll last easily four, five, maybe six hours until your, your uh, next meal. Now, the other thing I do ask people to do is do a 12 hour fast overnight. Uh, this might sound 12 hours, half a day, it sounds like it's quite challenging, but the reality is you'll actually be asleep for most of it. And uh, the interesting thing in terms of this seasonal and circadian eating that we no longer do is we eat quite late into the day. Uh, there's lots of people having snacks right before bed. Um, and interestingly, we see that the later we eat in the day, the more strong insulin response we're going to have which means we're locking away our fat stores. We're not going to be able to burn them and we're actually going to potentially lay down more fat. So I want to be really upfront and honest with you that there are challenges and this, this happens any time that we're trying to form a new habit. The whole reason we have habits is that they are easy and we can uh, live our lives and do certain processes in our lives on autopilot. So when we're trying to develop new habits, you know, for instance, if we've eaten cereal for breakfast for 30 years, 
it's going to feel like a really big change. We're going to have to think about now, what's the alternative to cereal? What am I going to eat for breakfast? We've got to write it on a shopping list, think about what our plan is, go out and get the thing and clear out our shelves, take away the old cereal and put in the new low carb option. So, you know, habits do, and this is why for weight loss uh, patients, I don't encourage them to look at scales for at least the first two weeks. Just get used to this new way of eating and don't worry about the scales or anything like that. Leave all your before shot in the before and get used to these new habits. In terms of feelings, again, when we are forming new habits, we have that challenge of really thinking mindfully about, oh, I always have a glass of wine after I put the kids to bed and that's at nine o'clock or I have some dessert at nine o'clock or when I feel stressed, I head for a chocolate bar or a croissant or whatever it is. So we need to think about them. A very common feeling and certainly this is something uh, for me is once we get into low carb and we see how effective it is for weight loss and for helping resolve a whole host of health conditions is that we actually feel angry that nobody offered us this as an option ever in our lives before. So, um, yeah, so there can be intense feelings and those feelings can involve other people. It can be confronting for our friends and families when we make the decision that we don't want to stop off for the coffee and the compulsory cake. Um, you know, it's confronting that we're making a choice to look after our own body. Um, and certainly for me in the early days, I had to not say no thank you to social events that involve cake and junk food because it was just too much of a trigger for me and it was too hard to sit there and not eat it and watch everyone else eat it. So the other thing also is that sometimes the people who love us in a household love us the way we were and may unconsciously sabotage our efforts and present us with cakes and baked goods out of the love of their heart. But really, you know, this is something we going, may have to manage through. The other thing is keto flu. Now, certainly there are a couple of key things we can do to avoid this. It's absolutely critical that we take in plenty of fluid, clear fluid, preferably water or herbal teas every day. The other thing also is, just as we talked about before with blood pressure, is that our body will be dumping salt and other electrolytes. So we need to keep our electrolytes up. I'd make a comment here that if you are on... Um, uh, medications for heart disease such as calcium channel blockers or you have already kidney disease where your electrolyte balance is very critical please do seek medical advice or do this under supervision in terms of taking electrolytes because you need to keep it uh, under control for the rest of us we can just generally increase our sodium potassium and magnesium at this stage i will point out to you that bananas are not the best form of potassium and there are plenty of low carb sources so you don't need to eat bananas because they are full of sugar the other thing i'd also point out is that um, that low carb and certainly you know with this summit it is we're focusing on a way of life it's a lifestyle that most of us are committing to for the rest of our life um, so the diet mentality won't work but what we're wanting to do is I want you to find a form of low carb that's sustainable for you and that you can um, successfully uh, take advantage of for the rest of your life the last thing is set a time to reflect periodically. It might be once a week or once a month or seasonally, that type of thing. Um, certainly the, the longer you're doing low carb, perhaps you um, may need to, ref you don't need quite so much time in between, but just uh, look, have a look at your milestones. Think how do I, how's my body feeling? How am I feeling inside of myself? For those of people who are using low carb for neurological conditions, how you're feeling inside your own head and your heart. Um, also things like skin, hair, nails are going to give you a clue as well. 
So other factors that will influence our low carb journey are things like moving. It's, uh, so if we look back to this pre-agricultural, this ancestral body, the body we evolved with, we evolved and we moved and we were hunting and gathering every day and our bodies were active. Um, so, so probably, uh, and you, and you notice this, I don't say exercise, just keep your body moving to whatever, uh, capability you have every day. And certainly in the beginning, just keep it very low key. Uh, and you'll find that as you get into better and better shape, that you'll actually want to move your body more and you'll enjoy it more. The other really important thing is sleep and adequate sleep is seven to eight hours a night. Apart from 5% five five of the population do have a genetic mutation, which enables them to uh, live on far less sleep. But for the rest of us, we need our seven to eight hours. And when we have reduced sleep, that's going to affect our hunger hormones and that in turn is going to uh, affect our food choices the next day. We're going to be far more likely to uh, head for those quick fix foods, the sugar, the caffeine, the stimulants. Um, and the other thing is that uh, sleep deprivation definitely affects our stress hormones. And then we come to our last point, which is mood. So stress back in those days when we evolved in terms of fight or flight, we our sources of stress we use usually required a physical response. We had to fight something or we had to run away from it. So our stress reaction in our body is all geared for us to get up and start running or perhaps punching, but hopefully not. So the thing is, when we experience modern stress, which is in an office at a desk, our body is asking us to do something very different. And that's where it loops all the way back around to moving. So one of the best ways of managing stress is to get moving and do some fairly intense exercise. Um, a great way of doing this, which is low impact, is swimming. And believe me, the pool police aren't out there to check if you've had your legs waxed or not, and they don't care how you look in your bathers. So just get out there and do it because it's good for you. So here we get to our stall strategies. So interestingly, if we've uh, combined, for instance, intermittent fasting in with our low carb, or we have signed up to some sort of app and we've said we've got a certain weight loss goal and it's reduced our energy by however many kilojoules or calories every day. If we're doing this day in, day out, it can actually suppress our metabolic function. And that is the real power of what we call intermittent fasting is that it is exactly that, it's intermittent. Some days we do it, some days we're on a refeed and we feed our body adequately. Um, and I certainly encourage people don't do that very low calorie thing day in, day out, because you can suppress your um, metabolic rate. The other thing, uh, too, too much cardio can actually be quite stressful. We certainly see this in endurance athletes, that it's very, very stressful on their bodies. So again, there's a sweet spot for exercise, not too little, not too much. Just do it wherever, whatever suits you. And if you need to, seek professional advice of how to implement that. Stress, just as I mentioned previously, that will affect um, our hunger hormones and it will affect our food choices. And it does also affect our blood glucose. So again, that's going to bring on potentially an insulin response and lock away our fat stores. So the other thing here, and the thyroid is the organ, it's just in here um, and it um, determines uh, really our metabolic rate. So for Australians and New Zealanders and a few other countries around the world, uh, we live in geologically ancient uh, lands and our soils are already really poor in terms of the amount of iodine they have. So there's a whole bunch of Australians walking around who are iodine deficient and that's a micronutrient that's really critical for thyroid function. So uh, just be aware and if you need do get that tested. The other thing is allergies and intolerances. It's very easy, especially those of us who don't cope with milk so well. 
um, I don't deal very well with soy or milk and I am actually allergic to peanuts and have had a cross reaction to pea protein. So there's a whole bunch of things when we have an allergic reaction, whether it's that Ig reaction, which is very fast, so naturally we steer away from them. But when it's an IgG reaction, it's quite slow and that brings around quite a lot of inflammation and that will make us retain fluid and stall our weight loss. So have a, have a real think about uh, foods that might not be working for you and think about uh, just excluding them from your diet for a while. I'd, I'd recommend two to four weeks minimum to get a good idea. Energy creep. So, you know, as we get used to our low carb life, we may discover things like low carb baking. And uh, interestingly, within this is there can be a few ingredients that aren't helpful just generally. Um, and that would be dairy products, uh, nut meals and artificial sweeteners. Now, I noticed that uh, artificial sweeteners I would consider them definitely a weaning type food uh, when you start out and you're trying to moderate down your sweet tooth, but eventually they're not that great. Even though they don't create a glucose response, many of them do create an insulin response. Um, so again, once we have that, we're locking away our fat stores. Now, carb creep, we can start off and again, uh, sometimes it's seasonal. Christmas, birthdays, all that type of thing where we're just starting to eat, um, you know, a little bit more food. We start eating a little bit of potato. We start eating a bit of that. We have a slice of bread. We buy a new packet of cereal and don't really look at it and realise how carb it, how full of carbs it is. Just do um, have a look at the carb creep. The other thing is fat creep. Fat is the most energy dense macro there is. And certainly it is very easy to overeat just sheer energy with fat. So you may, I get stacks of clients going, I'm on keto, I'm in ketosis, I'm peeing purple on the little urine strips and I'm not losing weight. And the thing is they're just having too many fat bombs. If we have too much fat through our diet, we don't have to burn our own stores. Too many treats, this is really covering all of what I've said. Um, the problem with treats is especially the sweet treats are p potentially gonna trigger us to overeat. Um, so they're not helpful either. And the last one is alcohol. Alcohol is the most energy dense, it's not really a macro, but an energy dense thing, uh, food out there. It's very easy to consume too many calories. If you're trying to lose weight, drinking lots of alcohol is an own goal. Um, the other thing also, when we're low carb, we're giving our liver a little bit extra work to do. So I like to love your liver and give it a bit of a break and just back off the alcohol consumption a bit. So we're nearly done. Going forward, I'd really encourage you, there is stacks and stacks of information out there. But the most important thing for me is that you learn to be a critical consumer of health information. Um, get to know, look for uh, resources that are written by people who are actually quoting research. The unfortunate thing is uh, nutrition research is actually, has a very poor level of scientific integrity itself. So what you wanna do is look at a publication, look at the conflicts of interest, where you know are the people who are writing this publication or research paper are they employed by the pasta industry I've come across plenty uh, and again have a little dig through news articles that you see and this is where you're welcome to always contact someone like me I'm going to start doing more of these blogs do have a look um, there are movies out there that are promoting certain uh, ways of eating that have got a very very poor level of science behind them so um, the other thing also is, particularly if you are on medications, be informed about what your medications are doing to you. Uh, medications are a two-way street. Uh, in some aspects, they will re reduce your risk of uh, disease. 
you know, uh, if we've got high blood pressure, we might be prescribed medications to reduce our blood pressure. But the unfortunate thing about most modern medications is that they're really there for symptom suppression and they do have other risks associated with them. Um, a classic example of this is statins where they reduce our risk or they reduce our cholesterol, which is associated and causality is not yet been proven, associated with cardiovascular disease. But unfortunately, uh, it's now becoming evident that statins actually increase our risk of developing metabolic disease or diabetes, which in themselves actually promote much more risk of cardiovascular disease than the cholesterol in the first place. So, um, please do be a critical consumer of your health information. The second point here is in terms of support. I really, really strongly to encourage you to find a community to support you. There's plenty on Facebook, on social media. Some are more friendly than others. Some are very stuck in their very strict rules about how they do it. Uh, if you're an omnivore and you're eating plants, don't join up a carnival Facebook group and tell everyone how you had broccoli the other day because they're going to just jump on you and say, that's not carnivore. So, you know, think about where you're getting your support from. Also do identify either friends or family who are supportive of you. Definitely with your family members, talk through with them what you're trying to achieve. And certainly when I have patients come in, I really like it if they bring their spouse, their significant others, and we have a talk about what they're trying to achieve and how they're doing it with the low carb and you know how the family can really support people um, most or many of the presenters here are also practitioners we are all here to support our clients and our patients I can guarantee you that I am absolutely 100% behind all of my clients and patients and I sincerely believe that with the right support that we can all make these great changes to our health and our life um, my experience is that I have walked this path. I will never ask a patient to do anything that I haven't done. And I have tried some crazy diets and some of them are absolutely miserable. Um, so the, the last thing is remember to celebrate. Um, preferably, if possible, try not to reward yourself with food or food treats. Um, buy yourself some, well, if, if you're uh, on a weight loss journey, Reward yourself with a lovely new uh, trip to the shops and some new clothes, some new underwear. Uh, something I like to reward myself with is new gym gear, new runners, because I go through them much quicker than I used to. But please do remember to celebrate. Uh, and lastly, remember to sing out. There's so many people who can support you, who've got professional qualifications and accreditations behind you. We're here for you. We'd love to support you. And I wish you all the very best in your journey with low carb.